Hey everyone, today I'm going to be giving you a Risk of Rain 2 character guide for the Engineer. Not only is the Engineer one of my favorite characters to play, but I do believe he is one of the strongest characters in Risk of Rain 2 if you use him correctly. This character guide is going to be focused entirely on how to play the Engineer correctly. Again, this is a character guide and not a character build. A character build would be where we were talking about the items and item synergies on the engineer and there will be a section for that later in the video but we're mainly going to be focused on gameplay let's start out by addressing the engineer's abilities and mechanics the engineer's first ability and primary attack is bouncing grenades as you can see on the screen the status text displays that the bouncing grenades is a charged ability that will shoot up to eight grenades each doing hundred percent damage each it takes about 3 seconds to fully charge this ability, and each separate bouncing grenade will proc its own items. This means you are going to be charging up 8 grenades, and every single grenade that hits an enemy has a chance to proc and does its own separate damage. A neat trick to use when you're playing the Engineer is that you can sprint while charging this attack. It is extremely simple to do, all you need to do is start charging the attack and immediately start sprinting afterwards. The X crosshair will disappear and you will now see a carrot icon. You should be able to still hear the ability going off to know that you're doing it correctly. You should also be aware that the ability will automatically fire off when fully charged, so always make sure to be pointing at an enemy. As for the engineer's secondary attack, he has a choice between two separate loadouts. You can either choose the pressure mines or the spider mines. I will be putting both of them up on the screen now and you can see that the pressure mines actually do more damage when they are fully armed. However, it takes 3 seconds for it to be fully armed, which means you are going to have extremely delayed damage. Plus, as you play the engineer, you will realize you are using these more like grenades rather than actual mines. And by that I mean that you are going to be chucking these into large clumps of enemies so you can get immediate damage on these enemies. With that in mind, you're probably always going to be wanting these spider mines. They do double the initial damage and can seek enemies just in case your mines might have missed, basically just preventing you from wasting any of your mines. Regardless of whichever mine you choose, you can only lay down a maximum of 4 of the mines. Placing any more down will result in the oldest one being destroyed. This really isn't a problem for spider mines as you only start out with 4 charges, but the pressure mines have 10 charges so it is far easier for you to end up destroying your useless mines. There isn't really much else to say about your secondary other than the fact that it sticks to everything, including allies, turrets, drones, and your bubble shield. Speaking of which, the engineer's utility skill, the bubble shield, is one of a kind in Risk of Rain 2. Every other character in Risk of Rain 2 gets a mobility skill with their utility. Yes, even Rex, who toots his way across the map with his fart move. So the engineer is actually at a severe disadvantage compared to the other characters with mobility utility skills. Although, technically this is an advantage in overall survivability as no other character in the game has an oh shit button except maybe of course Mercenary and perhaps Huntress if you count her dash. What I'm really trying to get at here is that if you don't play intelligently around your bubble shield, you are more likely to die than any other class. But enough rattling on, what does the bubble shield actually do? Well first, the bubble shield is an impenetrable shield that blocks all incoming damage while letting outgoing damage pass freely through the shield. Notice the phrasing on that description. Impenetrable shield, but not impassable shield. This is because the bubble shield is actually impenetrable. As in, no attacks including your own or your allies can go through it, however anyone can walk into it including enemies. Essentially, if you place your bubble shield down in a bad spot, your allies or your turrets can no longer shoot certain enemies, and once the enemies are inside the shield, they can shoot freely from inside of it. So try to avoid that situation if at all possible. Besides that though, the bubble shield has a 25 second cooldown with a 15 second uptime. In other words, there's only going to be 10 seconds where you are without your bubble shield. Some of you might be having trouble with the timing of your bubble shield expiring. An easy trick to use to know when your bubble shield is about to expire is to look down at your cooldown bar. When the bubble shield says it's going off cooldown in 10 seconds, that means it is expired. Using this trick, you will always know when your shield is about to expire and when you should skedaddle. Other than that, there's not much to the bubble shield, it's a rather simple ability. All you need to do is aim at the spot where you want the shield and press your utility skill button. Finally, we can now talk about the Engineer's turrets. Much like the Engineer's secondary ability, you have two choices. 
you can either choose the gauss turrets or the carbonizer turrets. I will be throwing the stats on the screen and most of you are probably going to side with the carbonizer turrets on first glance. I mean they look superior in just about every way, they have double the damage and they are mobile. Yet the stats don't really tell the whole tale. Because the carbonizer turrets are mobile, they break the bustling fungus synergy with the engineer. And this is one of the greatest synergies in the game. This will be explained in the item synergy section, but even if the carbonizer turrets didn't suck as much as they did, I still wouldn't choose them just because the bustling fungus synergy is too strong. And of course, the quirkiness of a mobile turret does not outweigh the importance of being able to situate your turrets in locations where you want them to be. But of course, it's a playstyle choice, and you can pick whatever turret you think will make you have the most fun. In any case, both turrets have the exact same mechanics tied to them. Both turrets copy the engineer's items, and both turrets share similar stats. On the screen now is a comparison of the engineer stats to the turret stats. The first thing that might pop out to you is the fact that the turret actually gets more base damage, which then scales better throughout the game. A rather interesting fact to note is that the turret is actually not doing 100% of its damage when it shoots. It is instead doing 70% of its damage and 100% of the engineer's damage. This makes a pretty noticeable difference when it comes to certain items. An item like a tri-tip dagger which uses base damage is actually stronger on the turret, but an item like the ATG which uses the total attack damage is going to function the exact same way and do the same damage as it would on you. Speaking of how the items work on the turrets, let's now get into the raw mechanics behind how the items are copied to your turrets. Most of you probably know by now that the engineer's turrets copy all of his items. Every time you pick up an item and place a turret, the turret will immediately get that item. Of course, if you pick up another item, the place down turret will not get that item. You will have to place a newer turret down, and this new turret is the one that receives the new item. Why does it work like this? Well, the simple answer is that the turrets copy your items and create their own duplicates upon being spawned. These duplicates or instances are unique to the turret that they are tied to, which is why in the previous example, the first turret you place down doesn't get the other item. They only create new copies of your items when they are first spawned. Now this produces some fairly interesting results when paired with certain items. A Dio's for example, which is an item that gives you a free life but becomes worthless upon being used the first time, is really good on the engineer's turrets because they copy the item from the engineer's inventory and create their own instances of the item. In practice, this means that every time a turret dies, it will use its own Dio's and the one in the engineer's inventory will not be touched. If this confuses you at all, here's an analogy to help you wrap your head around it. Let's say you have a key to your house and you want to copy it so that your friend can get in your house when you're not home. The copy that you make is independent from your original key, even though it functions the exact same way and it is basically a direct replica of the item. So if your friend lost the key, it doesn't really matter because you still have the original key. Of course, if you lost your key, you could no longer make copies from your key. I hope you see where I'm going with this. The engineer is the owner of the original key who can make copies of it with his turrets. However, once the original key, or in this case whatever item you are trying to copy to your turrets, is lost, it will no longer be able to be replicated. Also, certain items like Brittle Crown or Transfusion do not work in the way that you would think they would on your turrets because of this exact same mechanic. Your turrets do not give you money for Brittle Crown and they do not lose you money from your Brittle Crown. In the same vein, any kills that your turrets get will not count towards the engineer's transfusion, it will count towards theirs. And upon placing a new turret, the turret will now have zero charges of transfusion. Because of course every new turret creates unique instances to itself. Quite a long winded explanation I know, but now you know everything that the items do on your turrets and why they do that. Now on to the more boring stuff about the turrets. Each type of turret, the Gauss and the Carbonizer, have two charges with an independent cooldown of 30 seconds. Placing one turret down, waiting 20 seconds, and placing another turret down will result in you having another charge in 10 seconds, with the final charge coming back within 30 seconds. And that kind of wraps up all of the Engineer's abilities. Now we can move on to gameplay and how you should be playing the Engineer and using these abilities to your advantage. This next section is going to be focused entirely on gameplay and I'm going to include some boss tips as there are some bosses that are pretty troublesome for the Engineer and can end most runs if you don't know how to properly play against them. 
I guess we should start out by discussing the engineer's optimal rotation. Unlike other characters like the Huntress or Mercenary, the engineer doesn't really have a bunch of combo moves he can chain together for massive damage. Rather, he is more objective and area focused than the other characters. His rotation, if you can call it that, is usually just placing down a turret, maybe two, and putting the shield on top of them with some grenades either stuck to the side of the bubble shield or onto the turrets. Afterwards, you as the engineer will be running around sprinting and charging your bouncing grenades. In the early game especially, your turrets are rather weak, so you're mainly going to be playing the bait so that your turrets can be doing as much damage as they can. This usually includes peppering larger enemies like bosses and trying to get them focused on you. I guess to summarize, you could technically say that the engineer's rotation is using his special twice, throwing down some mines, throwing down his utility skill, and running around like a monkey. Again, the engineer doesn't really have a rotation. What you should be focusing on more than your rotation as the engineer is the location on which you are fighting. Optimal turret placement is key as there are certain areas where enemies simply can't reach and makes your turrets almost invulnerable to damage. Not only does this allow your turrets to dish out damage without worrying about dying, this allows you to save your utility skill for moments where you're about to die. As I said earlier, the utility skill is kind of like an oh shit button and certain scenarios where you might get caught off guard like Elder Lemurians popping up right next to you, Lesser Wisps spawning in groups of 10. These are situations where you desperately need your bubble shield to cover you from the initial damage they'll pump out. Remember that in Risk of Rain 2, time is your enemy and the enemies get stronger as time increases, so you should always be looking to go to the next stage as quickly as possible. This means that you're going to have to be a little bit careful with your turret placement as every charge takes 30 seconds to recharge. Using both of them in a bad spot will waste over a minute of your time. I prefer to only use one turret to kill most enemies except for bosses and difficult to kill enemies like the elites. And speaking of bosses, before I pop the teleporter I try to clear out as many waves of enemies as I can. Now this is more of a general tip for any character that lacks AoE but you don't want your turrets to be shooting beetles while you're trying to defeat the teleporter boss. So clear out all the trash mobs as quickly as you can and try to get your turrets to hit the boss. My two tips for anyone doing teleporter bosses as the engineer are as follows. One, you should never pop the teleporter boss without an extra charge ready to go. This is because certain bosses can spawn in really weird areas, in which case you're going to have to replace your turrets so that they can actually hit the enemy. Or there are other bosses that can insta-kill your turrets, in which case you are going to need to place your turret down again. My second tip is very similar to the first. Always have your bubble shield ready when you pop the teleporter boss. The reasoning for this is simple. You always want to have your oh shit button ready. Alright, now that we're on the topic of teleporter bosses, now we can talk about the bosses that really give the engineer a hard time. I'm talking about the Imp Overlord, the Clay Dune Striders, the Stone Titans, and the Magma and Overloading Worm. If any of you have ever played the engineer before and have ran into the Imp Overlord, you should know why he is the most dangerous teleporter boss to come across. Not only can he teleport directly into your bubble and start pummeling you to death, but he also can instantly kill any of your turrets. Seeing as how your turrets are roughly 50% of your damage, this is extremely difficult to deal with. The one way I have found to beat the Imp Overlord as the Engineer is to basically just cheese him with turret locations. The clip you are seeing currently is a clip where I put my turret on the high ground in an area where the Imp Overlord could not teleport to. The Imp Overlord was basically just forced to stand in front of the turret and take all of its damage while missing every single attack that it has. It could not get into melee range and its weird bleed attack that it throws out could not reach the turret. Granted that I was pretty lucky with the location where the teleporter was spawned, but most locations where the teleporter spawns there's going to be an area kind of similar to this. If not, the next best way to beat the Imp Overlord is simply to charge the teleporter until the point where no other enemies spawn. This makes it so the only target that your turrets will be hitting will be the Imp Overlord, and the Imp Overlord won't have any friends to start kind of killing your turrets. As for how the fight should really play out when you're fighting an Imp Overlord, you should be placing your turrets down spread out as far as possible. Like I said, the Imp Overlord can instantly kill your turrets, so if you put them close together, he will kill them both instantly. Better to spread them out and have him take a longer time to kill them both. 
Also, whenever he teleports, make sure to throw down all of your mines to where he is teleporting to so that you can get some quick burst damage onto him. Finally, you should be sprinting the entire time, charging your bouncing grenades, and trying to get him to aggro to you rather than your turrets. You as the engineer can run around and kite him a little bit, but your turrets cannot, so take that roll, be the bait, and hopefully kill him as quickly as you can. Play Dune Striders are difficult for the engineer to deal with because of two reasons. One, if they get close enough to your turrets and finally do the sucking, your turrets are going to be healing it. And two, your bubble shield will not protect you from some of his projectiles. His heat seeking explosive balls that he does when he stands up tall, those stick to your bubble shield and wait until it's down and then they will come in and hit you. For some reason they don't explode upon contact with the bubble shield, so make sure that you leave the bubble shield at the opposite end of wherever they're stuck to. Beating the Clay Dune Strider is roughly the same as beating the Imp Overlord. Simply kite the Clay Dune Strider around as much as you can so its explosive attacks don't end up on your turrets. Again, spread your turrets out in this fight as well because the AoE from the bombs can kill your turrets if they are not properly shielded. Keeping the focus off your turrets and moving your turrets to the highest ground available will allow you to beat the Clay Dune Strider without too much trouble. The Stone Titan and the Overloading and Magma Worms aren't really that dangerous against the Engineer, however they do end up causing him a bit of trouble due to their abilities. The Stone Titan for example has a ground punch which knocks you into the air, and usually this will be used in conjunction with their laser. If you are facing multiple Stone Titans, you will usually end up getting double lasered and this is certain death. The Engineer has no way of dodging any damage while he is in the air and knocked up from the Stone Titan's fist. Literally the only way to survive this is either have enough luck with your tougher times that it blocks all if not most of the damage, or having a stealth kit, which when it procs will cause the titans to no longer laser you. The easiest way to counter this is to just strafe. Even when you're in the bubble shield, just strafing a little bit will cause the titan's attack to completely miss you. The titan attack will always try to guess where you're going next, so if you keep strafing you can basically dodge it all the time. Now the magma and overloading worms are dangerous for a similar reason. They move through the ground and will hit you even if you are in your bubble shield and punish any engineer that sits on top of his turrets. Realistically, they don't pose that much of a threat to any engineer that's keeping mobile, but if you're forced into your bubble shield by large groups of enemies, then you're going to be in trouble. Whatever you do, always keep moving against the worms and never let them hit you with their heads, as this does a massive amount of damage. I guess I could add another boss here, the Allied Warship Unit. He's incredibly dangerous to the Engineer, especially for his knock-up attack, as the Engineer has no mobility to escape the AoE of the knock-up attack, and does not have a dash ability to negate the fall damage. The one way to deal with this as the Engineer is to have a Hapu Feather, as a Hapu Feather used right before you hit the ground will make it so you don't take any fall damage. But in all seriousness, don't even fight the Alloyed Worship unit because it's kind of busted. And that's it for my gameplay tips for the Engineer. Now we can move on to items and item synergies with the Engineer. This is the section of the guide that details the actual character build for the Engineer. I will also be listing out all of the items I believe are really good on the Engineer, and by that I mean specifically good on the Engineer and not just generally good for everyone. So starting out, let's talk about the best synergy for the Engineer. This is, of course, Bustling Fungus and Nehukanas. With these two items, not only do you have immense amount of survivability, but you deal a hefty amount of damage as well. The Bustling Fungus will create an AoE around any character that stands still for about 2 seconds, and this effect actually works on your turrets as well. Because they are always immobile, these turrets will always proc the Bustling Fungus. What's even better about this is that the Bustling Fungus AoE can overlap. So not only do you have two turrets that can heal each other with their AoE heals, but you can also get in there and have a third AoE heal. Pair this with the Nehukanas, which shoots out a flaming skull every time you heal 10% of your max health. The damage that the flaming skull does is based off of how much that health is. Higher max health equals more damage. If we take a look at all of the values here, Bustling Fungus heals you for 4.5% of your max health per second. For every extra stack of Bustling Fungus you get, you get an extra 2.25% max health per second. Plus the AoE range increases, and honestly this can get to an insane range if you get enough stacks. 
So the Nehokanas, it shoots out a flaming skull every 10% of your health, right? So that means at one stack of bustling fungus, a turret will shoot out a skull every 3 seconds. Overlapping another turret with this heal will result in the Nehukanas proccing about every one second. And of course, don't forget, you can stand still for a couple seconds in between both of your turrets, which will then overlap onto them and make them shoot even more skeleton orbs per second. Both the engineer and the turrets have the same max health and they scale the exact same amount. So you'll both be doing the same amount of damage with the Nehokanas. A rejuvenation rack will double all of your healing, which ends up giving you more survivability and more damage from your Nehokanas. Don't get baited into picking up a Corpse Bloom, however, because there is a cap on how much health per second you can heal with a Corpse Bloom. I believe that the cap on the Corpse Bloom is that you can only heal 10% of your max health per second, which means you can only proc Nehokanas once every second, which is a great reduction in damage. Avoid the Corpse Bloom at all costs. Okay, now that is the best synergy for the Engineer. Now let's talk about all of the items that the Engineer really likes to have. Again, these are going to be items that are specific to the Engineer. These items aren't going to be listed in any particular order, so don't think the one at the bottom is the worst and the one at the top is the best. I'm just listing them as I have them written down. The Hapu Feather is one of the best items on the Engineer as it allows him to get some much needed verticality that every other class in the game kind of gets. Being able to ignore most ground based enemies is pretty huge and the fact that you can negate fall damage by jumping at the very last second before you hit the ground makes the Hapu Feather really good on the Engineer. Next is the Wax Quail. The Wax Quail on the Engineer allows him to dodge so many projectiles. Stone Titans are especially deadly to the Engineer as he has no mobility, but with one Wax Quail, he can dodge almost every single beam. And that's not even to mention the fact that the Wax Quail is pretty fun to use. The Little Disciple, which is a yellow item, aka a boss item, that drops from the Grove Tender, is super good on the Engineer as well. Being one of the three survivors in the game that can sprint while attacking makes the Little Disciple extremely strong on the Engineer. And for those of you who don't know what the Little Disciple does, it's sort of like the Nehukanas where it shoots little orbs at enemies, but instead of being healed, all you have to do is sprint for the Little Disciple to shoot its orbs. Dio's Best Friend is also one of the best items in the game on the Engineer. I would say that this item is really, really good on the Engineer, but kind of okay on everyone else. Basically, all Dio's does is gives you an extra life and then becomes unusable upon its first use. As I explained previously, your turrets don't use your Dio's, and so they will always have an extra life. Hard Light Afterburner is another great item on the Engineer. This gives your utility skill two charges and reduces its cooldown by 33%. Even if the Afterburner didn't give you the two extra charges on your utility skill, it would have 100% uptime on your bubble shield. I don't need to explain to you how important it is to have your bubble shield up, and having two extra charges as well is super nice. Chrono Bauble is also a really good item on the Engineer. Okay, no, I'm, I'm just kidding. But the Red Whip is actually a good item on the Engineer. And it's an item that only the Engineer can fully utilize. Because the Engineer doesn't always have to be in combat, I mean, that's what his turrets are for, the Red Whip will always be active as long as you don't shoot or get hit by something. It basically just makes it easier for you to scout the map while your turrets do all the real work. Still not that great of an item, but better on the Engineer than anyone else. The Rose Buckler is a good item on the Engineer as well because as I've said multiple times throughout this video, the Engineer can sprint while he's attacking. The extra armor and thus damage reduction you get while sprinting is super nice on the Engineer who doesn't really have that much of a health pool, so it's definitely one of the better items on the Engineer. If you want to know more about how armor works in Risk of Rain 2, I will leave a link in the description to an article I wrote about armor in Risk of Rain 2. Continuing on. The Stun Grenade is another good item on the Engineer. Certain enemies that you might face, including the Stone Golems and the Clay Templars, have attacks that can be interrupted by stuns. While you can sometimes dodge the Stone Golems attack, the Clay Templars are far more difficult to avoid. With no other way to kill a Clay Templar other than slapping a Bubble Shield down and hoping you can kill him before your Bubble Shield runs out, the Stun Grenade is really good as it will interrupt his machine gun. To wrap this item list up, we have the Bandolier and the Aegis. The Bandolier causes enemies to drop an ammo pack that will refresh all of your cooldowns. Please do note that the Bandolier ammo pack will only refresh one charge of your turret per ammo pack. 
you will need to pick up two ammo packs if you have zero charges of your turrets. Finally, the Aegis gives you a barrier once you have overhealed. Basically, once you've healed the full health, you will now start to gain a barrier that will go up to your maximum health. Because of how barrier works with one shot protection, this is doubly good and will essentially give you two shot protection. All one shot protection is is a built in risk of rain 2 mechanic that basically makes it so that no enemy in the game can one shot you. And that's it. That's my engineer guide for risk of rain 2. I really hope that this character guide has helped you and hopefully you learned something watching this. If you do like the video, please leave a like and if you want to give me any feedback at all, please leave a comment below. If you want to see more content like this, then subscribe. Anyway, thanks for watching. I'll see you again some other time.